if you've been following my YouTube channel and been reading my articles, I have discussed what scholars call the two powers in heaven. Yet St. Charbel, pay attention, because I'm not aware of anyone using I'm not trying to toot my horn. What I'm saying is this came to me by reading a war called Joseph and Asinath. There is a Jewish writing written before or during the time of Christ. Scholars are debated. Is it, was it written 100 years before Christ, 100 years after Christ, or in between? But nonetheless, it's not a Christian source. And it documents why Joseph married an Egyptian woman, Potiphar, right? If you read the Old Testament, why would Joseph marry an Egyptian? So the Jews came up with, an explanation. Why would he marry an Egyptian? Well, number one, obviously, he's in Egypt. There are no Israelites, right? But why her? Well, this story depicts her as being a chaste virgin, was actually God-fearing, whom God heard her cries, right? And then gave her to Joseph because she was a pious woman. Everyone with me there? Her name is Asinath. In the tradition. Asinath in the tradition. Okay, everyone with me there? Okay, now, this book affirms a concept called two powers in heaven. Two powers in heaven, which some would call two gods in heaven. There were Jews before Christ, during Christ, and even centuries later, that believe there were two divine powers, what we've called two divine persons, what Peter Schaeffer calls two gods in heaven, Yahweh and the second divine person subject to God. Do you know that? I've done sessions on these, and I've written articles on these. I'm going to show you a Jewish precursor to the role of the Blessed Mother, showing you the understanding of the role assigned to the Blessed Mother is thoroughly Jewish, and affirms that even the Jews understood there were female spirit creatures, that the angels were both males and females. And this is actually confirmed in Zechariah 5, 9. We'll get there. The two powers of the Samaritan religion. That's Article 1. You scroll. Two powers in heaven revealing Israel's second God. Just put in the word two powers in the search engine. This is what pops up. Notes. I did a session on this, correcting Kelly Powers' blunders. Notes for Kelly Powers versus Dustin Smith debate review. Okay. Here it is. Metatron is the word of God. Is Metatron the word of God? And then what you find at the bottom says older posts. Do you see it? You don't stop there. You click on older posts and look what pops up. Okay. Challenge to the rabbis, right? Seeing the God of Israel, I challenge them to answer. Metatron, Israel's second God revisited. The angel Metatron, right? Judaism's second Yahweh. You guys seeing this? Okay, then you go in and again, click older posts, right? Judaism's views, right? Judaism's views on the pre-human, on the Messiah's pre-human existence. And I have one on two gods in heaven. So you get it now, all the articles? You keep scrolling until you find them. And then you can put two gods. All right, so everyone got it, right? Okay. Now, this book, this source, Joseph and Asinath, which you can read online for free. Okay. Asinath is another source that confirms the widespread Jewish belief in two powers in heaven, two distinct divine persons or two gods. What we call divine persons, they would have called two powers. That's what the rabbis called it. And as the rabbis became more anti-Christian in their rhetoric in subsequent centuries after Christianity, and also as they were dealing with Gnostic heretics who were using the Old Testament passages to prove there's more than one God, the rabbis became strict and would condemn any Jew who believed in more than one divine power. But early on, it was an acceptable view among Jews. In fact, it is believed 
that many, if not most Jews, before and during time of Christ, believed in two powers. So what you have in Christianity is the confirmation that the second divine power, the second divine person became man, Jesus Christ. So that the Christian view of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, thoroughly Jewish, as admitted by Jewish scholars, right? Even a rabbinic Jewish scholar, Daniel Boyeran, and others. It's a lie when rabbis like Tovia Singer, that's Slav, and Muslims say that the Jews were Unitarians. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The sources before, during, after the time of Christ show a large segment of Jews who believed in two powers. And that what you have in Christianity is the affirmation that that second divine power, the second divine person, became flesh, became man, and he's now known as Jesus Christ. This is a fact. I give you the sources from the scholars and these ancient Jewish writings. Okay, now, Joseph and Asinath is another writing that mentions that Asinath was visited by the commander of the army of Yahweh. Let me give it to you. Let me show it to you. You guys want to have taste because now watch how it ties into the Blessed Mother. All right, watch here. It's in my article. Let me bring it up. This is why I have my old computer because I have the document here. All right, here it is. Here is the Torah online. Look what it says about this book called Joseph and Asinath. Okay, Asinath. You ready? Let me show it to you on my phone. Here's what it says. This is a Jewish website. See what it says? Joseph and Asinath. A text, right? You see it? Click on the link so I can read it. A text from Hellenistic Egypt, circa 100 BC before Christ era, 200 C, 100 Christian era AD, tells a romantic story of Joseph and Asinath's courtship. Initially, Asinath rejects Joseph, but then falls in love with him, only to have Joseph reject her because she's the daughter of an Egyptian priest. It's only after she repents and changes her allegiance to Israel's God that Joseph marries her. Okay? You guys getting this? Because how does this point to the status of the Blessed Mother? You guys ready? Okay, let me quote to you some snippets. If you read, if you read this work, watch here. I'm going to give you the link to archive.com so you can read it. And I'm going to tell you what chapter. You're going to start reading from chapter 14. Right, all the way to chapter 17. But I'm going to give you the relevant chapter because I'm not going to read all of it. Here's the link. It's on archive.org. You're going to read chapters 14 to 17 because I don't want to talk about the second power right now because you even have a precursor to the Eucharist where the commander of the army of the Lord gives to Asenath honeycomb and then he touches it and becomes blood and he points the blood in different directions. Notice honeycomb, something sweet to eat that he touches becomes blood. Blood. Hmm, sound familiar? Is this a precursor to the Eucharist? You want me there? Yes, make money. If you want to call it, I'll help you. All right, now, here's the part that has to do with the Blessed Mother. Are you ready? Click on that link, brethren, because I'm going to show it to you. Because I'm just going to do chapter 15, a part of chapter 15. The Blessed Mother. You ready? This shows is going to affirm that Jews believe that there are also female angels, female spirit creatures. And this is found in Zechariah 5.9. I'll show it to you, Zechariah 5.9. So don't assume that angels are only males. There are female angels, spirit creatures, but they don't procreate. They don't have sex. Right? Okay, now watch. Let me show you what it says from my article. You ready? Get ready to see how this points to Mary. Here's there it is, chapter 15. Get ready to be blown away. When I saw this, I was blown away because now it shows you the status given to the Blessed Mother in the ancient churches is thoroughly Jewish. It's found in Jewish sources. It's not pagan. Here you go, brethren. You ready? Uh, let's read. Take heart, Asenath. Lo, the Lord has given you to Joseph to be his bride, and he shall be your bridegroom. And you shall no more be called Asineth, Asineth, but city of refuge shall be your name. Right? 
For many nations shall take refuge in you, and under your wings shall many peoples find shelter, and within your walls, those who give their allegiance to God in penitence will find security. Now watch. Here it is, a picture of the Blessed Mother. Jewish, buddy. This is not pagan. For penitence, there's a spirit creature that's female that's called penitence, is the Most High's daughter. She entreats the Most High on your behalf every hour. So there's a spirit creature called penitence, symbolizing those who repent, that's praying for Asinath. She's God's daughter. And on behalf of all who repent, so she prays for all who repent. For he is the father of penitence, and she the mother of virgins. And every hour she petitions him for those who repent, for she has prepared a heavenly bridal chamber for those who love her. Those who love her, she prepares a bridal chamber for you to dwell with her father, God. And she will look after them forever. And penitence is herself a virgin, very beautiful and pure and chaste and gentle. And God most high loves her and all the angels do her reverence. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? A virgin whom the angels revere, daughter of God, whom God loves and adores, who prays for virgins and all who repent, and who will bring you into the bridal chamber, make you acceptable to God, right? Beautiful and pure and chaste and gentle. Does that sound familiar? You want to reread it one more time? Joseph and Asenath, are you not listening? The one among us? You want me to read it one more time? All right, here you go. Chapter 15. And then I'm going to show you in Zechariah 5, 9, there are spirit creatures that are female. Female spirit creatures. Watch here. Okay. For penitence is the most high's daughter. She's God's daughter. She entreats. She intercedes. The most high on your behalf every hour. That means she's aware of people's situations on earth. And on behalf of all who repent. So she prays for all who repent because she's penitence, meaning she points to penitence, repentance. So when you repent, you delight her heart. For he is the father of penitence and she the mother of virgins. Every hour she petitions him. She's interceding for those who repent. Now that means she's aware of all those who are repenting. For she has prepared a heavenly bridal chamber for those who love her. And she will look after them forever. She will look after them forever. And penitence is herself a virgin. Also a virgin, daughter of God, whom God loves, right? Who's very beautiful and pure and chaste and gentle. A virgin who prays every hour for those who repent and for virgins. God loves her and the angels revere her. Now, penitence is a spirit creature. Penitence is a spirit creature. She is a female spirit creature. She's called penitence because she's the one who represents and stands in place of those who repent. So why is she called penitence? She's the one assigned to pray for the penitent and repentance. So if you're wondering why she's called penitence, she was created to stand in the place of those who repent to pray for them. You understand the point? You understand why she's called that? She's the one who prays and intercedes to her father, God her father, for those who repent and are penitent. So she's called penitence because she represents the penitent and stands in their place to intercede for them. Is that making sense before I move on? Okay, for penitence is the Most High's daughter, and she entreats the Most High on your behalf every hour. 
and on behalf of all who repent. You see? For he, God, is the father of penitence. And she, the mother of virgins. So she's the mother of virgins, and she's a virgin. Now notice, every hour, that means she's aware of what's taking place on earth, because God makes her aware. So every hour, she petitions and deeds before God for those who repent, and she will prepare a bridal chamber so that you can be wedded to God for those who love her. You got to love her, and she will look after them forever. So she looks after you. And penitence is herself a virgin, very beautiful and pure and chaste and gentle. And God Most High loves her, and all the angels do her reverence. It's thoroughly Jewish to say that Mary is a virgin. She is pure, right? She is chaste. She's the daughter of God, whom God loves, and angels revere her. This is a thoroughly Jewish concept. You get it? So this notion of Mary being a perpetual virgin, beautiful, chaste, and pure, the daughter of God the Father, whom God loves, whom angels revere, who petitions God for those who, who return to him and seek her intercession, who then watches over you through her petitions. Thoroughly Jewish. The second thoroughly Jewish thing is that in Jewish faith, you find Jews who realize they're both male spirit creatures, male angelic creatures, and female spirit creatures, female angelic creatures, and that's even found in your Bible, Zechariah 5.9. And since we have no customers, we're going to wrap it up. Zechariah 5, 9. Here it is. Hope you were blessed. I had to do a late stream because I got to be out tomorrow early. I got to check out and then wait to check into another hotel before I drive back Monday, God willing. Here it is, Zechariah 5, 9. Okay. Then I raised my eyes and looked. Zechariah 5, 9. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings. Then I raised my eyes and looked, okay, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings. Two women, huh? And they have wings. Two women with wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, which is an unclean animal. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Do we got it? Everyone got it? So the Bible that we all accept, Zechariah, mentions two Female spirit creatures, we know they're spirit creatures, they have wings. Women with wings, wings of a stork, carrying the woman evil in a basket, locking her up in Shinar Babylon until the appointed time. Okay, everyone got it? These are upcoming articles where I'll do sessions on them. I don't know if this is the one among us. Is that you, buddy? Are you the one among us? Yeah. Okay, so... You ask a question I've answered 10 million times. So are you asking because you want to try to refute the point? Uh, no. So I've, I've actually – all right. So I, I was Muslim. Uh, oh, my, okay. father's from, my father's from Morocco, and I actually converted into Christianity. And, Praise God. Praise God. and I Go always – I've always been kind of um, – I guess because of my my Islamic background, I've always been kind of iffy about how the, you know, the Catholics pray to saints and the the. Even though you had something similar in Islam, right? Huh? Even though you had something similar in Islam. Well, I mean, Islam is all corrupt, anyways. I mean, no, I'm I'm saying, glad. Well, no, follow me. I understand. I'm gonna follow you because I didn't know you were out of Muslim background. I didn't know who you were the one among us. I don't know who you are. Now that I know. When you are a Muslim, this notion of praying to saints, it permeates Islam. It's all over Sunni and Shia Islam. When you have the <clears throat> Asharis and Maturidis who seek the intercession of Muhammad or of angels or of even what they call the awliya, the friends of Allah, or the Shia do that with their imams, that's no different and foreign to Catholic or Orthodox belief. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you were a Salafi, Salaf one of those strict 
Muslims, then you're acting like a Protestant. So just like in Christianity, you have the Protestants who are adamant against communion of saints. You have those Muslims, the Salaf Asana, the Salafi Muslims, who are like Protestants and condemning communion of saints. But the rest of the Muslims, the Sufis, those who practice the Sawwuf, those who believe in Tawassul, the Asharis, the Maturids, and the Shia, all believe in what we call pray, praying to the saints. Just to let you know, even in your background. In fact, when you prayed five times a day, you were speaking to a dead man. When you did yeah. Tashawwuf, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. That's why I'm wondering. So why would it be yeah. something troublesome for you when you were already predisposed to that notion. The only difference is Muhammad is not a saint and these Muslims are not saints. So I, I think what it is, is that anytime that I've heard anybody uh, in the Catholic church speak about it, like even when they talk about like confirmation and stuff like that, how they say that they try to embody a saint as, as they take on the attribute of their name and everything like that during confirmation. And it just seems like kind of, idealistic in a way but so taking names of biblical characters it's not biblical so when you find new testament all of these jews are being named after their ancestors like joseph and abraham or jacob in fact joseph jesus is not adopted father why do you think he's called joseph i don't know and then jacob his father why do you think he's called matthew 1 16 it says jacob begat joseph who was betrothed to Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, because of their ancestor, Jacob, who had a son named Joseph. So they took on his name, yeah. Of course. So this pattern of taking on the names of holy men and women filled with the Spirit, used mightily by God, is all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. So these are... Uh like prophets though right that were used by god or characters that were used by god in the exactly. in the whole and mary's not the, used by god then who was used by god you're right yeah peter was not yeah, used by right. god. yeah so the idea of naming yourself after important figures whom god worked through mightily and boldly and they were filled with the spirit is all throughout the old and new testament just look at the names in the New Testament. Even Jesus' so-called brothers, James. James is Yaakov. That's Jacob, mm -hmm. right? Or Joseph. That's Yosef. These are names of past figures, figures who played important role in salvation history. So this was a common feature to name your children after the mighty men or women of old. Even the word Mary, the name of our blessed mother. Moses' sister's name was Maryam Mary. So there's mm. no conflict there. So, but ask me, because I want to help you. I didn't know your background. So remember, I don't know who you are. So sometimes I get, but I'm glad that you're not a troll you're asking. So keep asking me, because I want to be used of the spirit so, to help you. So another thing that I was trying to ask you about, and I know you've gone over this. I've watched a couple yeah, of your I'll videos. Go I'll go over it with you again. Go ahead. Um, so you were talking about um, the angel of the Lord yes. uh, that's in that's in the Old Testament that um, I heard you say tonight that they look at it as two powers in heaven. And I'm assuming did, yeah. the other one was the angel of the Lord, right? Yes, that's exactly to them. The angel of the Lord was the second power. But then as the Jews became reactionary towards Christianity and even Gnostics were using these texts to show, no, there's more than one God. Then they changed their view from the second divine power to being a mere angelic creature. That's it. That so was the response. How does that to... work? How does that work? If, if even in the story with Abraham, it says the Lord said to the Lord in heaven, rain, fire, and brimstone. They explain it away as simply a literary way of speaking of the same person like first kings 8 1 solomon sent builders from solomon well that's not two solomons which is a terrible argument because the one lord is on earth and the other lord is in heaven so that doesn't work but they find ways to get around it when you've made up your mind something can't be true you will explain away all the evidence no matter what, a, what it is you'll find a way to avoid 
accepting it. What about when God speaks in plural on creating mankind in his image and in his likeness? How do they explain that? They say that's God addressing the angels. Well, that so I believe the Holy Spirit revealed something to me yesterday when I was explaining this to somebody. And it said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, right? Yeah. But we're the only creature that has been told biblically that we are made in the image of the Almighty. Yeah. So now, if we're made... Well, now, that's what they'll say in argument from silence. God said you're in his image, but nowhere it says you alone are in his image. They'll say, where does it say only you are in the image of God? Well, if we take the descriptions of angels written in the scripture mm -hmm. then none of them look like us yes i mean i thought they'd take on that form okay so but god himself is not a man so you're saying god looks like you or he looks like a woman be consistent what you're saying okay yeah yeah that's right if we follow your argument being an image of god means angels have to look like us are you saying that god looks human so that even before the creation of humanity, God looked like a man and a woman because he created men and women in his image? That's a tough question, yeah. That's because that's not what image means, right? Once you understand what the word image means, it's going to be hard to prove humans alone are in the image of God. I'm not saying they're not. But I've heard people, even recently, I was listening to Kelly Powers, and I, I made a commitment I won't attack him personally anymore because – he went through four, year, four hours of intense battle against heretics, and he held his own. And when someone defends the triune God because he loves and worships the triune God, I have to show respect because it's not about egos. It's about the glory of the triune God. Anyway, he too makes the mistake that I've heard people like Matt Slick make. Humans are not created in the angel, image of angels. Okay, but who told you that angels are not created in the image of God? In other words, someone will tell you, when God says, let us make man in our image, it can't be angels because we're not created in the image of God and image of angels. But someone who's sharp will turn it against you. Wait, who told you you need to be created in the image of angels? If the angels are created in the image of God, just like humans, then that means God could be speaking to the angels saying, let us make man in our image because angels and humans are created in the image of God. So I'm not creating the image of an angel, but like an angel, I'm creating the image of God. See, that's a response to someone who wants to refute your interpretation. You see my point? Yeah. Okay, now, to come back to the issue, the way you respond to that argument isn't to say, well, we're not creating the image of angels. It's to show that whoever God is speaking to, they must be involved in creating mankind. Because it says, let us make man in our image, right? Mm -hmm. But in verse 27, it says, God alone by himself created mankind. The angels did not help him. And this is confirmed in Isaiah 40, verse 13, and Isaiah 44, 24, where God had no one, no counselor to counsel him and assist him in his work of creation. And where Isaiah 44, 24 says, God made all things by himself. So it cannot be angels because angels did not help God at all to create anything let alone man. So, okay. So in, in reference to them trying to say that we go to Isaiah for that, showing that there was no. Yep. All by himself. Yeah. Isaiah 44, 24. It says, I am the Lord who makes all things. I stretched out the heavens by myself and I laid down the foundations of the earth all alone. So he made all things, heaven and earth by himself all alone. You get See, my point? That's, yeah, I, I wish I had that at the time. And yeah, you're absolutely right. When they go to try to refute that, they could definitely use that argument as well towards me. And then it comes down to us dictating what is the image and like, you know, like, yeah. yeah. So Isaiah is definitely closes that. Being an image of God means that you're called to visibly manifest God's characteristics, his nature, his power, meaning. God is almighty, God is all holy, God is all good, God is all righteous. So you are supposed to reflect God's power, his might, his goodness, his justice, his compassion, visibly, because God is invisible. 
So it's more focusing on the moral aspects of God that you're called to image and manifest in your actions because you are visible, he's invisible. So the invisible God is holy. You make it visible by living holy. That's the teaching of the Bible. I got you. And that's, so that's, that's Colossians, right? Yeah, I see. Colossians says that you're being renewed in the image of your creator in righteousness and holiness, right? Mm-hmm. It says that's that... What... Uh, yeah, yeah. It says that Jesus was the image of the invisible God as well. So. Yeah, but in Colossians 3, 9 to 10, it talks about being renewed in the image of your creator in holiness and righteousness, as well as in mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, 24. So to be in the image of my creator and to be restored to that image means... To be holy and righteous and, and pure and loving and just like him. It's talking about being fashioned after God's moral character, moral characteristics, as well as manifesting God's rule in creation. Meaning, I rule creation on behalf of God and I rule the way God rules and I do it visibly because people can see me. All right, Sam, I want to ask you one more thing before you go, right? Or before I, I get off of this, right? Um, I wanted to ask you, what is your take on um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being born again? Yeah, well, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're immersed in the Spirit, and the Spirit then unites you to Christ and makes you one with Him. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, specific. 12 to 14. So baptism of the Holy Spirit is to have the Holy Spirit immerse you because the word baptism can also mean immerse and dip where the Holy Spirit immerses himself, right? Or immerses you in him, comes upon you and then unites you to Christ and makes you one with him. So you become part of the, the body of Christ. First Corinthians 12, 13. Born again means to be born of the Spirit. That's when the Spirit comes upon you, changes you and unites you to Christ and makes you one with him. So do you think that there's salvation for people who are not born again or who haven't received the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus says, unless you're born again, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven. But now the question is, someone who's never heard the gospel of Christ and doesn't know who Jesus is, but he cries out to the God he knows who exists and asks for mercy. Can God then regenerate that person so that when that person dies, he'll enter heaven and he's regenerating him because of what Jesus did for him. And when he enters, then Jesus will make a note to him, I am the one who heard your cries, and I'm the one who saved you because of what I did for you, though you are not aware of who I was on earth. Yeah, God can do that. So do you think um, we can take, what steps do you think that we can take biblically in order for us to be able to enjoy the baptism of the Holy Spirit or to be a part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You've turned to Christ. And confess and you've been baptized in the name of the Father and the Spirit, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's my whole point. If you haven't, you're not part of Christ or you're not saved. Because if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have Christ. Romans 8, 9 to 10. He who does not have the Spirit of Christ, Romans 8, 9, does not belong to Christ. So if you haven't been baptized of or in or with the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. You're not saved. You're in your sins.